Pat Novak. Or higher. Sure. I'm Pat Novak. For hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, sure, you can spell it 50 different ways, but down on the waterfront in San Francisco, it all means the same thing. You pay and I'll do, and the customer's always right if he's got an open wallet. Then I'll match it with an open mind. Unless he's after murder, then the price gets out of range. And down here, you're either high on your toes or flat on your back, because most of the time you get only one kind of pitch, fast and inside, and you don't try if you're foul because nobody cares. Even then, you can't complain. During the summer, the morgue's the coolest spot in town. Oh, I rent boats and wrap up small sins and $20 bills. The money's good when you get it, but there's no retirement plan, and you can't buy vaccination for trouble. I found that out last Wednesday night. I closed up shop about 8 o'clock, and I started walking home. The city was down on its hands and knees trying to crawl through one of those San Francisco hot spells that blast by every five years. From up on the hill, the Chinatown tenements lined up down below like sweaty little kids waiting for a shower. It was heat and headaches all the way. But when I opened my front door and stepped inside, who wanted to talk about the weather? She was standing in the dark smoking a cigarette, and the silhouette her figure cut against the window was something you'd never believe. Then she reached over and turned on a lamp. It was a fast, dizzy trip, but when I got around to her eyes, they were the kind that made you think of hard-working geysers. Deep and warm, and you knew you could count on some fast action when they came to a boil. The smile was familiar, and the lips were red and moist, like a souped-up rose waiting for a bee. Oh, she did lots of nice things with her mouth, and talking was one of them. Patsy, welcome home. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's good to see you, Georgie. What's on your mind? Patsy, can't you ever take your time? It's not mine, it's borrowed. Anything special in mind? Mm -hmm. Easy business. Got a drink? Mm-hmm. How easy? Just about boat ride. You can't get hurt. That's what they told the Spanish Armada. Getting soft, Patsy? No, not in the head. Now, look, if it's work, let's talk. Otherwise, let's just be cute, huh? All right, Patsy. The last time you saw me was a year ago. As far as you know, I'm not in town. Fine? You tell me. Go on. Tomorrow night, a freighter's due in here from Shanghai. The SS Calcutta. I want to be on the welcoming committee. Who says you can't? Nobody yet. But the ship's going to anchor in the stream, so I need a boat. I need you. I'm not the social type. I don't think I'll go. Believe me, Patsy, it's an easy trip. So is falling downstairs. Come on, let's deal or drink. All right, Patsy. My stepmother's going to meet the Calcutta, too. Who's she? Mrs. Sheila Lampson. She likes parties? She likes a package she's going to get from somebody aboard the Calcutta. Uh -huh. What's in it? That's her business. I just want to make sure she gets that package of straw, all right. You in on it? She doesn't even know I'm in town. Who picks up the check? Here. Well, Forty dollars covered. It's too much for an easy job and not enough for a hard one. Where do I find you if I need bail? Here's a phone number. You can call me there tomorrow. And Patsy. Thanks. I don't forget easy. Why the rush? Because you scare me, Patsy. You really scare me. You remember the party, Patsy? Yeah. But memories are like everything else. They wear out. Then let's make some new ones, Patsy. to move down the hall toward the stairs. The white dress she had on was plain enough, but it didn't have a mind of its own. It just did what it was told and tried to behave, but Georgie and nature wouldn't let it. There was only one catch in seeing Georgie. She always left too soon, like a small bottle of fine whiskey. Well, it must have been a good five minutes after she left when I heard the buzzer. I was looking for the white dress when I opened the door, but I was looking the wrong way. <laughs> with an echo and it came down hard on the side of my head. I went down like mercury in a quick freeze. The trip wasn't nice, but it was long. Halfway there, I came up for breath and I found the deck of one of my own boats under me. 
The Bay Bridge lights were still around, and that made it kind of cozy. When my eyes got me focused, the smooth-looking bundle laid out next to me shaped up like Georgie Lampson. She wasn't looking her best. I had just enough time to remember a pair of women's shoes standing next to my face. And then I must have moved, and they punched my ticket for a return trip. The next time I opened my eyes, I was looking up at the lights on Pier 19. Oh, the shoes were still there, but this time they were black. And the feet inside squashed out wide and flat like tired beefsteak. That meant only one thing. Hellman from Homicide. You can stop playing mouse, Novak. Get up. The party's over. Yeah, Hellman. I thought they'd never go home. Your boyfriend here isn't talking. Are you bashful? Yeah, Novak. He's real shy. He's dead. Who is he? That's what you get paid for. What about the girl that was here? County Hospital. You better pray she makes it, Novak. Because you like blonde Hellman? Because nobody beats two murder raps, Novak. Oh, you talk funny. So does this hunk of lead pipe. Your prints are all over it. What's that make me, a plumber? Better than that, Novak. The pipe fits the dent in that guy's skull like it grew there. Well, maybe he's the plumber. You're smart, Novak. Now, come on. Who's the guy and who was the dame? He's Georgie Lampson, the guy I don't know. Who will, Novak? We'll take care of that. Oh, you try hard, don't you, Hellman? You move your lips when you read, you use your fingers when you count, but you never get the right answer. Don't tell me, Novak. I'm not my cherry best in the morning. You don't have a best, Hellman. You tried thinking once, but it gave you a headache. Now when you get in a squeeze, you have to pound your way out with your fist. <laughs> I warned you, Novak. Now talk nice and save teeth. Yeah. I'll talk when that blonde tells her story. If she makes a grade, how does she figure? She met me in my apartment last night on business. Five minutes after she left, the doorbell rang. When I answered it, somebody sapped me. Now you take it from there. Yeah, I will. Right to the DA. Go ahead, Hellman, but don't look hurt when the case blows up in your face. You're giving odds? That's all I'm giving, Hellman. You figure it. I took the gal and this girl I don't even know for a ride at three in the morning. We had a party and I killed a guy. But the gal I only messed up good because I like the way she talked. You sound scared, no? Well, I'm not, Hellman, but you are because it doesn't add. Why did I beat my skull with that same hunk of pipe? And how did I drive back here to meet you? Keep your mouth open, smart boy. They got a little green room up at San Quentin. Gets awful stuffy when they close the door. Well, after I left Hellman, I figured I'd had a bumper crop of trouble for one day. The sun was just beginning to stagger up over the Berkeley Hills when I caught a cab uptown. On the way, I stopped off for coffee and a 6 a.m. chronicle at one of those little Greek joints off Geary Street. The windows were blind with grease and the light was bad, but the reading was money from home. The story made me stop counting the lumps on my head. Professor Burton Lampson, who'd gotten himself murdered in a Shanghai hotel room a month ago, and they were sending his body back on the SS Calcutta. It was due to anchor in the bay that night, like Georgie said, but the shipping page didn't agree. The Calcutta was listed inside the gate at 7.30 the night before. How did that check out? And what about that package that had everybody worried? Well, when I got back to my apartment, I called the hospital to check on Georgie. Well, they were still giving odds, the long, thin kind. A little later, I was in the middle of a cold shower, adding up rows of zeros and getting different answers every round when the phone rang. It was Hellman, and he was selling nothing but smiles. You feeling any better, Novak? Oh, don't tell me you're worried. We just identified the dead guy. His name's Warren Haynes, local social lad. You know him? Yeah, I'm an old friend of the family. The guy's from one of the old families in town, the important kind. His blood wasn't blue. No, but we are. We're feeling the pressure already, so I'm calling you in today for a little talk. That's a great job, Hellman. You keep right on smacking your fat lips because you're going to get more answers than questions. That's funny, Novak. I didn't think you knew the difference. When I hung up the phone, I was seeing more red than the bleachers at a bullfight. I probably would have walked right by him if he didn't open his mouth. Even then, it wasn't much more than a loud squeak. He was a skinny guy standing against the door with a half-smile twisting his mouth and a bright, wild look in his eyes. You seem disturbed, Mr. Novak. Where's your invitation, mister? This should prove sufficient, Mr. Novak. All right, so you want a gun. What happens now? Now, Mr. Novak, I use the gun unless you hand over the package. Sorry, mister, you're in the wrong laundry. Mr. Novak, I've been crossed once today. I don't intend it shall happen twice. The package... Now, look, you, I'm going to spell it again. I don't know what you're talking about. Now, take that cannon you're pointing and... I think you realize I'm about to use this gun, Mr. Novak, for the last time. All right, all right. You'll find it right over there. Now here, right next to me. Come on, give me that gun before somebody gets hurt. He stood there for a minute, shaking his head as if he wanted to go back and wipe five minutes from his life. All of a sudden, he jerked around on his tracks and he stumbled for the door like a timid drunk when you tell him he's had enough. Then he folded up hard against the wall on his knees. But it was a little too late for prayers. 
I stood there for a minute trying to think of a good lawyer who owed me money, but all I could see was a courtroom and a picture of Hellman smiling as he listened to the verdict. Well, accident or not, if Hellman dropped in with a body on the floor, he'd bury me so deep in San Quentin he'd be bringing me air in paper bags. When the knot in my stomach untied, I dragged the little guy away from the door and I rolled him on his back. His eyes were still asking for the package, but the rest of them didn't care. Outside of a few bucks, his wallet was empty, not even a laundry tag. Well, I got dressed and I pulled the blinds and locked the place up. And then I went out to look for the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor by the name of Jocko Madigan. He was a fine surgeon until something made him decide life was temporary at best. Now he's got a permanent post on a bar stool looking for answers at the bottom of whiskey bottles. Well, it's hard on the liver that way, but you're never short on dreams. I finally found him with a bourbon halo and a musty little Italian joint over in North Beach. It was a long stretch from Easter Monday, but he was still celebrating Irish independence. He looked like he was on the wrong side because his nose was a bright orange. Ah, Patsy, my boy, you're just in time. These simple but honest Sicilians have agreed to embark with me on a crusade. And as honorary past president of the Sons of St. Patrick, the uh, Powell Street chapter, I invite you to join us. Come on, Jack, I'll sober up. i got to talk to you. Oh, to fittingly observe the occasion of old Era's joyful victory, we're first fortifying ourselves with grappa and bushmills. Then we sally forth to chase all the snakes out of Long Beach and the cockroaches out of Chinatown. How does that strike you, Patsy? And uh, why aren't you smiling? Tis a glorious day. Because I'm in a jam and I want to talk, Jocko. Now cut it. Oh, Patsy, you remind me of that devil era fellow. You're sitting on the curb and pouting just because they won't let you march in front of the band in the victory parade. You're sour, Patsy. Admit it, Jocko. Will you snap out of it? I'm in big trouble. You're always in trouble, Patsy. You're a child of adversity, a son of scorn. The fates spit in your eye and you try to retaliate, but the wind's always blowing in the wrong direction. You're a lost leaf in the mortal storm, Patsy. You're a pebble shaking a tiny fist at the mountain. You would like to fight for some strange, fantastic cause, wouldn't you, Patsy? But you can't find anybody your size. Men are too small and the gods are too big. Patsy, you're lost. Are you all through? Yeah. What kind of trouble? Oh, it's a pair of bum murder raps, Jocko. Somebody sapped me in my apartment last night and I woke up this morning with a dead guy. That sounds interesting. Uh, what was it you were drinking? Hellman's out to pin this on me. Oh, a dubious honor. You uh, mentioned two murders. A guy came in my apartment this morning waving a gun and asking for a package that I never heard of. We started wrestling for the gun. Uh, mildly exciting. Now, who got it? He did, right in the chest. Patsy, you have absolutely no excuse for losing your temper. Why, you're not even Irish. Still, you're always getting hot-headed at the wrong time. It was an accident, Jocko. I didn't even know the guy. I'm sorry, but I can't cry. Sure, that's what the British general said after he hung Robert Emmett at the dock. But he didn't straighten out the Marcel in his neck. What are you doing out of jail? Well, you knock it off, Jocko. Now, look, did you ever hear of a Mrs. Sheila Lampson? Certainly, and uh, I'm very offended with her. In the past year, she set up drinks for every eligible and non-eligible in San Francisco except me. That sounds good. What else? Not much, but I often wonder what that poor old professor she married does with his evenings. Hey, stop worrying, Jocko. He's dead. Now, look, will you hop down to the Chronicle Morgue and check with Steve Nagel? Have him dig out all the old clips on the professor and Mrs. Lampson, will you? And while you're there, check on a guy by the name of Warren Haynes. You got that? Yes, but uh, what do I do for money? Half a buck for car fare and nothing for booze. Patsy, surely you're jesting. Jocko, will you quit clowning and get going? You say so, Patsy, but you've broken up a beautiful party. My Sicilian friends have gone to sleep and I'm thirsty again. Let's have four or five for the road, shall we? Later, Jocko. Oh, all right, Patsy, but only for you. Uh, by the way, where can I find you? I'm going to tag by the county hospital, and then I'm going to look up Sheila Lampson. If I remember the story correctly, Patsy, you'd better reverse your schedule. Good night, lover. When I left Jocko, I tagged by Mama Lupo's on Kearney Street, and I called the hospital again. Oh, Georgie was a little better. At least the undertakers had stopped bidding. Mama Lupo clouded up for a storm when I asked to borrow her new car for a couple of hours, but a few pats and a pinch, and she was all giggles and car keys. Ten minutes later, I was fighting traffic on Potrero Avenue. The south wind out there brought the slaughterhouses right into your front seat. I found the hospital out on the far edge, and it was a nice-looking pile of dirty red brick. 
The nurse in the ward didn't believe I was Georgie's brother until I asked her if she was busy Saturday night. Then she saw the resemblance right away. I found Georgie behind a couple of screens at the end of the ward. For a dying woman, she looked pretty good. She smiled a little when she saw me, like she was saving up for a bigger try later on. Patsy, I'm glad you made it. Look, I'm going to keep it short, baby. Who was it last night? Sorry, Patsy. Big deal. You can't tell her you won't. Can't, Patsy. Later I will. And that package, same deal? Same. Well, I got a deal too, Georgie, a murder rap. They want to hang it on me. Who was it? Warren Haynes. Do you know him? I remember. Good corpse. Now, look, you're slicing it awful thin for 40 bucks, Georgie. Patsy. Patsy, trust me. No choice, baby. You're driving. Don't go through any red lights. I want Patsy. Telephone, Mr. Novak. I said it was urgent. That's it, Georgie. I'll see you later. Yeah. Having a good time, Novak? You know any phone numbers besides mine, Hellman? Not today, bright boy. If you're near a streetcar, do I send a chauffeur? What's your beef? Our beef, Novak. We'd like it fine if you paid us a visit real soon. Sorry, Hellman. Book solid. Command performance, Novak. I wouldn't disappoint. What's the matter, Hellman? You want it in blood? I told you I don't know anything about last night. I never saw Haynes before. You got me wrong, Novak. This one's about a knife. We just found it in your office down on the waterfront. That's fine. Peel yourself an apple and keep busy. You better come down, Novak. We found the knife in some guy's back. <laughs> Houdini couldn't get out of that one in two hours with both hands and a can of olive oil. It was like chasing cyanide with a bucket of brandy. Well, it tastes bright, but it's only a matter of time. Well, I headed for Sheila Lampson's place, and on the way, I pulled up by a drugstore out in the Hate Street jungles and called the Chronicle Morgue. They said Jocko had just left, so I called the nearest bar and asked if they had a customer with a bright orange nose. They did. Jocko Madigan speaking. Jocko, this is Novak. What'd you find out? Ah, Patsy. Just enjoying a small refresher after some very excellent reading. For instance? Sheila Howard Lumsden. She started seeing the professor back in 46. There was a scandal, the, the nasty kind. And the professor's first wife, Barbara, jumped off the bridge, the uh, Bay Bridge. Yeah, go on. A month after she married the professor, Sheila was mentioned in every gossip column in town. So the professor took off on a scientific trip to China. A month ago, he was murdered in a Shanghai hotel and a hat full of emeralds was stolen. The authorities figured that the murder was premature. What do you mean? Well, the professor had had three major operations, and at the time of the murder, he had less than a week to go. What about Haynes? Haynes is one of those black sheep that wealthy families have uh, cut off without a penny. He's one of Sheila Lumsden's escorts, and he's now on his way back from the Orient on the SS Calcutta. Anything else? Jocko, I could kiss you. Patsy, you stick to your line and I'll stick to mine. Well, the puzzle was still a sack full of holes and question marks, but at least Jocko's leads had a little juice in them. I found the Lampson house in the best part of the Seacliff district. It was one of those big nervous joints hanging by its shutters to the side of a steep drop that slid down sharp into the Pacific. All green trim and stucco the color of mortgages. The front doorbell was wearing out in my hand when the maid showed up, and then she was tongue-tied. She didn't know a thing except good money when it was offered. And then she told me I'd find Mrs. Lampson in the second-floor sitting room. She went away. I found the sitting room all right, but Mrs. Lampson wasn't there. So I followed on through till I came to a bedroom with a bright red ceiling and a lived-in feeling. Reminded you of something Henry VIII might order for a bridal suite. She was sitting next to the couch holding a martini and making noises like a leopard on a honeymoon. Hello. You call me baby. Yeah. You always wear handkerchiefs to parties? Mm-hmm. Saves time. Dressing. You're nice. Have a drink? I'll fix them. Oh, you are nice. What's your name? Novak. What's yours? <laughs> Beauty. Is that a name or a game? <laughs> You're just like Mike. He's my new boyfriend. This is night off? Oh, no. We just went downstairs for a minute. <clears throat> hey, you fix a nice drink, Mr. Novak. <sighs> Warm. Yeah, you got a fever or something? No. Must be the weather, Mr. Novak. You feel it? <laughs> You're a big spender, aren't you? What do I do when Mike walks in? Smile? Oh, Mike's broad minded. How about Sheila? You fix a good drink, Mr. Novak. Ask a lot of questions, too. Yeah, well, that's because I like answers. Now, what about Sheila? Hey, 
You're going to get rough. I'll call Mike. All right, all right. I'm Sheila's sister, and it's much better when you're nice to me. All right, then let's start being nice, huh? <sighs> Mr. Novak. What was that for? I'm a big spender, too. Here, have another drink. I think maybe I'll have another you, Mr. Novak. Is that Mike coming upstairs? Could be, baby. Now, come on, where's Sheila? Oh, Sheila, Sheila, who cares? She's downtown, anyway. She won't know. She... Hey, where are you going? Sorry, baby, I got a date. I'm not busy. Well, I do. Don't let him leave, Mike. If he does, he's going to walk through me. I'm sorry, baby, he's not my type. Mike was a tall, wide package, so I gave him a bargain offer. He didn't fold after two, but he had a kind of hurt look in his eye when I hit him the third time, like I didn't know he could take a hint. When he wound up and hit the floor, every window in the house rattled, and I figured the Berkeley seismograph got a cheap thrill. I made it as far as the front door when I heard a car pull up in the driveway. When I got to the window, a dame and a guy were getting out of a new Nash and heading for the door. The guy was a middle-class gunsel, but if the gal was Sheila Lampson, she made nice opposition. Well, I couldn't wait around to see. I finally managed to make my apartment without having one of Hellman's men pick me up, and when I got in, Jocko was just pouring himself another glass of green dreams and posing in the mirror like a man of distinction. The stiff was still there on the floor next to a glass of ice water. Patsy, I don't approve of your choice of party guests. The guy's dead, Jocko. Oh. Well, in that case, I'll overlook it. This is the friend you were telling me about? When are you due at the gas chamber, Patsy? Any phone calls? Oh, now that you mention it, yes. Hellman? Regularly on the quarter hour. Not very coherent, but I got the idea he's looking for you. Also a call from the hospital. They wanted to know the whereabouts of a Miss Georgie Lamson. What do you mean? It seems she disappeared a few hours ago from one of their wards. Oh. Patsy, you look worried. Uh, perhaps a sampling of this delicate dollar ambrosia would help. Uh, try it. No, thanks. Suit yourself, Patsy. Myself, I'm an old subscriber to the Socrates' plan of self-destruction. If you want it done right, do it yourself. Uh, by the way, uh, have you noticed our friend's hands lately? Huh? It looks like he's entertaining a scrap of paper in his right hand. Yeah, I see it. Oh, let me see it. Oh. Hmm. He seems kind of stingy with it, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Uh -huh. Oh, an old envelope. Not even a coded letter to puzzle over. I'll settle for the address, Jocko. Take a look. Uh, Captain Edward Small, SS Calcutta, Paramount Line, Shanghai. Well, that's nice. Uh, shall we have another drink? Later, Jocko. Right now, we haven't got the time. Mm, that's who I think it is, Patsy. You're going to have lots of time. I'll just whip up a short one. Novak talking. Listen, smart boy, and listen hard. This is for the last time. You check in here in ten minutes, or I'll send out an all points. Dead or alive, Novak. All right, Hellman. There's a dead guy here in my apartment right now. His name's Captain Edward Small, off the Calcutta. I don't need any more bodies, Novak. I can hang you twice with what I got. All right, Copper. But if you want your picture in the paper tomorrow, you can meet me out in C-Clip in 15 minutes. 48 Camino Drive. When I hung up the phone, most of the puzzle straightened out like wet wash in a dry wind. Now there's one thing you can count on. When you bet on miracles, you buy a ticket straight through. I finally pulled up at the Lampson place, and I started looking around for Hellman. The joint looked about as crowded as a Kremlin breakfast for Senator Taft. I was taking a fast check, trying to figure how far they could have gone, when Hellman fought his way through the box hedge by the driveway. We circled down behind the garage and around in back of the house. We just made it in time for the curtain scene. Sheila Lampson was backing down slow toward the seawall, waving her arms in the air and begging every inch of the way. And Georgie stumbled after her like the avenging angel, and she had a gun. She had a coat tossed over her hospital gown, and the look in her eyes told the whole story. Tears and hate and lots of bullets. No, Mike. No, Mike, you've got to stop her. She's crazy. She's crazy. She wanted to kill me. What's so crazy about that? You're sweet, Patsy, but you weren't invited. Don't get too close to the animal. It's your gun, Georgie. Don't let it hang you. This is Hellman from Homicide. No good, Patsy. This one's for me. Isn't it, Sheila? Georgie, Isn't it for me? Please, Georgie, don't. No, I stop her. Stop her before it's 
All right, girls, let's break it up. Be good, Copper. You too, Patsy. It's your neck. It won't look good stretched. Please, Georgie. Don't eat that, Sheila. Not yet. First, I want to tell you how clever you are. How sweet you looked at my mother's funeral. How you ruined my father. How to speak with other men, Sheila. Oh, it was magnificent. Georgie. Georgie, please. I didn't know, Georgie. I didn't know it. I swear I'll make it up to you. Please. One other please. thing, Sheila. Listen to me, Sheila. Those emeralds you've got. The ones you sent Haynes to Shanghai for. The ones he killed my father for. They were glass, Sheila. Ten cent green glass. You hear, Sheila? Glass. Please. Georgie, please. Georgie, watch her. Sheila's got a gun. <laughs> Take it easy, baby. We've got a long trip. She's dead, isn't she, Patsy? She's dead. She didn't die, baby. With that much lead, she sank. It burns, Patsy. It burns. It'll cool. The fog's starting to come in. Remember the party, Patsy? Yeah, I remember. Then say it, Patsy. Please say it now. Say it. Yeah, Georgie, I'd say it. But you're not listening. Georgie's coat pocket that told most of the story, and then Hellman grabbed Mike and Sheila's sister and sweated the rest out of them. Well, it wasn't a pretty story, but it moved. When Sheila spent the professor broke and he checked out over in China, Georgie decided to blow the whistle on her. She made up that phony yarn about the emeralds, and then she let Haynes murder her father and walk off with him. They were glass. To make it look good, Haynes played Paul Bear and took the boat back with the body but not before Georgie tipped the captain and the first mate about that sack of emeralds Haynes was supposed to have. So they went to work. They robbed Haynes and planted a fake for a fake. It was a real cat and mouse game. Georgie only made one mistake, but sometimes that's all it takes. She flew back here a few days before the Calcutta got in so that she could be around for the payoff. One of Sheila's pals must have spotted her and trailed her to my place. And then the sapping started. That was the same night the Calcutta got in and people started checking packages and pulling triggers. When Sheila found her package was a fake, she figured Haynes was being cute, so he got it first. And then she went out after that original fake. She tried to double up and hang Haynes' body on me and get rid of Georgie at the same time. But Georgie didn't die easy. I don't know how the captain got on the moon, probably through Sheila. But her gunsel friends took care of the first mate with a knife when he got anxious. Well, when the dust lifted and they counted cold noses, it was a real devil's game. Wherever he was, Georgie's old man must have been holding his sides and rolling in the aisles. Yeah, a real plum. And Sheila found out when you get close enough to the seed, the taste gets bitter. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come a smart girl like Georgie bought something as stupid as revenge? I don't know. She was a lot better at a lot of other things. included Lois Andrews, Steve Brody, Herbert Litton, Jerry Hausner, Ivan Dittmars, Ray Erlenborn, and Hal Sawyer. This is a Larry Finley transcription. Brought to you from Hollywood. Hollywood.